Hi everyone, it's uh, John Van Wissett here and I'm looking forward to being on the uh, Unlaced podcast with the great man, Jake. John Van Wiss, welcome to the Unlaced podcast, mate. Thanks, Jake, aka Ronaldo. <laughs> I don't know what a soccer star you are. No, no, not at all. You've been calling me Christian Ronaldo for, for years. <laughs> I'm hoping it's just because we resemble the same looks as opposed oh, to probably the same sporting talents. <laughs> No, I'm, mate, pretty pretty pumped to have you on. I must say, I'm actually, this is probably one of the first guests I've had on that I'm a little bit nervous because... Really? Um, <laughs> John Van Wist, for those that don't know, and I do just want to give a bit of background on who you are before we get into the crux of the podcast because not enough people know who John Van Wist is, in my opinion, and more people need to um, because he's one of Australia's, if not the world's, greatest ever triathletes, as your good mate Johnny Locko would say. Um, he's on the oh, though. <laughs> but you've got a pretty incredible CV of achievements and I wanted to just name a couple straight off the bat. So um, you've been a world record holder of the Enduro Man Arc to Arc event, which for those that don't know, and we're going to go into the details of this in the podcast, but it's a run, bike and swim from London to Paris. So let's just pause on that for a second. That's just insane. You're the fastest Australian to swim the English Channel. You've won the New Zealand Half Ironman and you've won the New York to Manhattan Island Marathon three times because one wasn't enough. Um, and the lengths that you've taken your body to over the last 25 years in a lot of people's eyes would be inhumane, um, I think. And something I, I do want to get into the podcast today with you and I'm really interested in talking about is, I guess, your mentality around challenge and hardship and just further understand, I guess, what's driving you because... Um, it's pretty crazy some of the stuff you do and I, I guess I wanted to just hand over to you a little bit at the start maybe just to give a bit of background for some of the mm. listeners who don't really know the John Van Wist story but keen to get a bit of a start on on who you are for, for all the listeners out there. Oh, I don't know who I am. I'm <laughs> just a guy who likes to do endurance sports really. I'm not, um, not too good at sprinting so I've got to go longer and longer to get anywhere. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'd rather be... Yeah, well, the, to, to say that, that the first time I met you, um, well, not one of the first times I met you, uh, the, the, the one that stands out to me the most was actually I was training with our mutual friend, the, the Big Rig down at Dendy Park, and he was putting me, right. yeah, great man, shout out to the Big Rig, he was putting, through, putting me through my paces trying to help me get back into fitness and soccer, and um, I saw Johnny Van Wist just running laps of Dendy Park on the grass area where the, where the track is. And I'm like, what's he doing, Big Rick? And I'm like, you came past and they're like, oh, Johnny, how you going? And he said, oh, what are you doing here? He goes, oh, mate, I'm just having a rest day. I'm like, well, what, you're, you're running though? And you're running barefoot on grass. He goes, how, how far are you running? Oh, I'm just going to do 10K and head home. And mm. I thought, Jesus Christ, he's a different cat, John Van Wist. It's 10K rest day barefoot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. Um. So for, for those, as I've said, a, a detailed a bit of Johnny's background and some of the level of achievements and, and levels that you've gone to, but to get a bit more understanding of you, and, and I know you're a you know, pretty reserved character, you let your actions do the talking rather than you know, your mouth. And, um, but for me personally, I mean, I just want to know, like, what's your why behind everything you're doing? Like, why are you going to these lengths to challenge yourself? Oh, it's a good question, uh, Jake. You probably... Um Initially, my sister's also a marathon swimmer, or was. And um, when she was probably 15, she won a race from Bo Morris to Frankston, which was 20 kilometres. And um, she only entered it. She was the state 100, 200, 400, 800 metre champion. And um, this event came up, and she thought she'd just enter it for the sake of it, see how she, you know, a bit of a test. She beat the Australian champion. And um, I was actually paddling for her that day. I was the only little kid, maybe I was 10. Um, and then through that, we met the Australian marathon coach who ended up becoming my coach, Dick Campion, who's a, who's a great man. And, um, someone I really looked up to. And, uh, my sister kicked on and, um, ended up, she was dating an Italian world champion, Sergio Cadendini, who he actually got second in the world champs. And she was going to Italy doing all the, all the circuit, the marathon races over there. And I was at school and I hated school. And my dad was a real hard man. And, 
I really need an excuse to get out of school. So I said, oh, look, I want to be a marathon swimmer. So I didn't realise how hard you had to train. So I started training with Dick Campion, who, um, like I said, I really respect. He was a British Olympian. Um, he's right. marathon coach. And we were doing like 120K a week in a, in a 25-metre pool, which was like 12K in the morning, 8K at night, six days a week. So it was torturous. So I just uh, kept striving and started winning a few races and um, travelled around Europe, had a real good time. Uh, I mean, you don't make much money, but it's more at that age, you're just doing what you love. And, how how um, old were you when you were doing this? I was probably 19, I reckon, 19, 20. Okay. A long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, no, you're looking, you're looking well. So yeah. when did you start When did you start training with, with Dick Campion? Was it in I your early teens? Yeah, 17. so I was, always, I was always swimming and life-saving, keeping fit. I mean, that was my dad was a hard man. He was a printer. He used to work long hours uh, behind the machine, you know, fund everything. So he, as long as we were, you know, trying to achieve something, he was happy. So I just had to show, you know, an intent. And I actually, you know, you start getting addicted to it. You, you beat somebody, you think, oh, I could probably beat this person. And uh, makes you train harder. And then, like, so I had a fantastic coach with, um, with Dick Camp, and he really, really motivated me. You know, through those through those massive sessions, he used to walk walk the length of the pool most of the time with his two stopwatches and have a whiteboard and write messages on there. You know, write the name of my rival and say he's ten meters in front of you. You know, in the middle of the pool set, silly things like that. So we're going really well, and and then um, through that I came back and we Tammy and I, my sister Tammy, we wanted to be the first brother and sister from the English Channel. So um, this was 1993. So as a training session, we swam across Port Phillip Bay, which was um, Port Arlington and Frankston, which um, was a lot of uh, people had tried to do it. So the record, I think, was 15 hours at the time through, uh, through Linda McGill, our Olympic swimmer. What's back the in the distance? 60s. What's the distance for that? Oh, Port 40. Port okay. Arlington and Frankston. So we did that probably in February um, as a training session, and it got massive exposure because we had uh, Dawn Fraser on our boat. And, um, swimming icon. Yeah, so because because we had Dawn, we got huge publicity. We were like front page of the Herald Sun. I thought, oh, how good is this? Um, and I've got the record. Uh, beat the sisters, so I was happy. So we, we had a real good, we had a big rivalry going. And then uh, probably four or five months later, we had our booking for the English Channel. So I swam through winter. I was a pretty skinny kid. I was 19 or 20 years old. Um, believe it or not, I had a six pack back then. I was really proud of it, so I didn't, didn't want to lose my six pack. But when you swim in cold water, you actually need a bit of body fat to sustain your warmth. Right. So the English champion being, you know, like when we got there, it was 13 degrees. They were having a real, real bad summer. So you get you get a week's window and you have to choose a day in that week. And when we got there, it was gale force winds. And, um, we ended up having to go on a day where there were four, six winds and the water was 13 degrees. So we had a boat each and we raced across and I was hoping to get the world record, which was um, seven hours forty at the time, as, as well as being the first brother and sister to get across. Yeah. So I took off, and I had a good lead on the sister, and it was really rough, and I felt really good. And I thought, no matter what, I'm just going to, you know, keep charging. The cold won't get me. But it's kind of like um, when you're watching telly late at night, and you think, I oh, watch the end of this movie, and you end up falling asleep, and the te- telly's on in the morning. You just start falling asleep, so I end up passing out, and they had to pull me into the boat. And, um, quite a few people said they saved me, but I've given the credit because Dawn's the most famous. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Dawn so... resuscitated me, and I wake up in a in one of those silver space space blankets. So I didn't okay. get across. I was all France, and my sister got across, and she did the fastest time for the year. And the fastest person for the year um, gets a Rolex watch with your name engraved on the back and the time and the date. So I thought, oh, she's my sister's got across. She's got the, <laughs> the fuck. I'm male or female. I look like I look like an idiot. I didn't get across. Look like a weakling. Um, but I was I was pretty mentally distraught because I thought I was you know quite strong and the and the fact you just feel helpless when that happens. Um, but Dawn got in my ear and said, "Come on, let's go back the next year. Let's put on some weight." So I cut my training down to about sixty k a week. So I pro- practically halved my training and just started going on an eating eating frenzy. Like I would go to McDonald's and have like five Big Macs and things like that. So <laughs> I would eat so I was uncomfortable. Um, yeah. And I put on 23 kilos. And the next year we got there, it was a totally different country. The water was probably 16 degrees, three degrees warmer. 
it was like 20 degrees and sunny, um, light breeze. It was, and I, um, I actually got the Australian record. So I got across, I got the Australian record, but I got held up in the middle of the channel by a Russian oil tanker towing another one. Jesus. So I had to talk, tread water for 12 minutes. Because normally the, the, the oil tankers, um, they know, they know how it sounds silly. Normally they adjust course for you. This time, because it was towing another one, it didn't adjust course, and I had to stop, and I'm getting all angry at the boat, and I'm going, what are we stopping for? And he goes, you know, you've got to stop or you're disqualified. And I wanted to keep swimming. I ended up missing the tide uh, the other side, and that you know that cost me the world record. So I got the Australian record, um, and you know, I was happy to get across, but then I started thinking, geez, I could have got the world record, you know. Um, and then I got sick of I got sick of swimming because I was doing such a big case, and then I I did a total change and got into marathon running. Um, so I did my first mar- uh, marathon, the Melbourne Marathon, probably in 1995, and um, I was running 200 plus k a week, and I got real skinny again. And, and um, I wasn't a bad uh, runner, so I was I was actually at halfway. I was with the leaders. I was with a, a Japanese and a Kenyan. So I did. I was halfway and under under uh, one hour ten. I did the first ten k in thirty minutes because all my mates were watching. So I basically ran as fast as I could for the first ten k. Oh, no. With two other people leading, getting you know, getting on clear, I ended up blowing up, and I ran at two thirty nine. And at that time, I thought, oh, this is terrible, you know. But oh, now I look back and go, that wasn't a bad run. That's pretty um, good. I just, Jesus, uh, carried away. So then. I was trying to go for the um, for the Olympics. In my head, I was thinking, "Oh, I'm going to make the, um, the 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 Sydney Olympics in 2000 in the marathon running," but it just wasn't good enough. I couldn't get you know I couldn't get under the 220. You got to run a 207 to be competitive. So I was a bit delusional there. So, uh, but I'm actually a swim coach, so I coach a lot of triathletes. Mm-hmm. So they were saying oh, on the weekends I would do aquathons, which were swim runs for prize money, because basically living off a shoestring budget. And I'd win a few of those and beat some credential triplets. So the people I was coaching just said, oh, look, you beat so-and-so, you know, you should get on a bike. Because I started getting a bit, um, thinking, oh, I'm not going to make in the running, I'm just not good enough. I then started to jump on a bike. I remember the um, first time I borrowed a bike off a friend who's now my dentist and another guy who, you know, were a bit older than me. So I thought, you know, oh, geez, I'll be able to outride these guys. And they took me down to the uh, Edith Vale um, velodrome and these old guys were smashing me and I'm thinking what's going on I can't ride a bike <laughs> <laughs> you didn't realise it, it takes like two or three years of riding before you get good on the bike as well so then I got into the um, Ironman triathlon so I did that for a while and loved doing that Obviously, basically I was racing professionally but I was still working coaching you know twice a day and it was, it was more the life yeah. so I just loved the challenge it was something yeah. totally different it was a new challenge uh, and then I eventually got sick of that, so I went back to marathon swimming and it did the, um, the swim race around Manhattan Island, New York, which is an annual race, uh, 47 kilometers around the whole island. You swim around the whole island uh, anti-clockwise. Yeah. I won that um, three times, and, you know, I love that event because that, that was massive. You know, you're in, you, you get an article in the New York Times. And, um, it's just a huge, huge event, and um, you get a lot of exposure doing that, so... So yes, yeah, so I got, I did that for a few years, and I got sick of the swimming again. And then the um, the arch to arc came up. So that's the one you were talking about initially, which is you start in the Marble Arch of London, and you run 140 kilometres to the English Channel. You then swim the English Channel. You then cycle from Calais to the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, which is 291 kilometres. So the event is called the Arch to Arc because you start in the Marble Arch of London, and you finish in the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. So. So then I got back into the um, into the running again, and that's when you see me running the barefoot. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I thought, geez, I've got to have to learn how to, to run again. Um, I started. Uh, I started off. I did first fifty k training run, and I ended up walking home. I was running on Beach Road. And I, I've got the sledgehammered legs. I'm thinking, how am I going to hundred forty k? I got mates from the bike seeing me, you know, walk home. It was embarrassing. Um, so then I started doing a bit of research on. On uh, marathon because I was trying all the different um, shoes, you know, the real heavy long distance shoes. And it didn't matter what shoe I got, at about 50k, my legs just felt sledgehammered. So I started. Uh, I googled uh, Giannis Kouros, who is a famous ultra marathon runner who used to win the Sydney to Melbourne. Yeah. And um, 
he basically had no science. He ran like a duck with his feet out. And he, um, he, he used to eat that Greek sweet bacala as his nutrition. He, he just basically meditated when he ran. He, he used to do poetry in his head. So I tried running like him with my feet out and it didn't work for me. Then I found another guy, Dean Canassis, who was winning all the 100 uh, kilometer trail runs in America. And he had this philosophy uh, about minimalist shoes, which basically means you wear the lightest shoe you can. And he would walk around in his office barefoot with no chairs. And he would do barefoot running on grass to make his foot muscles strong. And then uh, when he raced... Explain to you at Dendy Park then. Yeah, so so I started running um, during the week uh, barefoot on the grass. And then the weekend, I, I started doing Dendy Park runs in a racing flat, you know, to Franks, Frankston and back. And I found I, my, I got real strong doing that. And then I started developing a shuffle style because I found, uh, you know, at 50K, your legs start... Um, coming lower and lower at the surface because they're so sore. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll try and start off with a low uh, shuffle. So I'd practice that on the grass, trying to bring my foot through as low as I, I can. I remember one 70-kilometre um, run. It was, I'd start at 3.30 in the morning on a Saturday morning. So I'd run from um, from Brighton to, to Frankston and back. I was just past the Sandy Pub, and I'm doing that real low shuffle and start. And I tripped on a crack, it fell over, had, had a real good song in my head, you know, thinking, oh, how good am I? Nice song. <laughs> Trip over. Next thing I know, I'm just, what am I doing on my concrete? Got to get up, blood all over my knee, my elbows. Got to, got, still got to run to Franks in the back. So, so the problem with that shuffle style was, yeah, I had a few trips along the way and it looked a bit goofy. Um, it looked like, you know, I, I was finishing my 70K run when I was starting. But I found <laughs> that, with, that with the barefoot training was fantastic. And I started really? uh, getting a real bucket out of doing my long runs and, and seeing how well I could do them. So when I did the arch, I actually did the, um, the fastest run leg at the time. You know, and I'm, I'm not built like a rail. Like, I'm not, no one will scorch but I'm still, you know, around 100 kilos. So so technically I'm not uh, built to be an endurance runner. And, um, and I, That's what's yeah, amazing I, though, because like that, that run, what's it at? Is 140 Ks the run? Yeah, it's brutal. Like it's like, it's hard to explain. You have to see it because... Um, you, when you go through London at the start, you, you, you get stuck at lights, and when you come to towns, you're stuck at lights, and you got to wait for people in front of you. They don't realise you're running 140k, and, and you, you're running on um, the back the back roads, and you've got like um, a headlamp, and you're running in the middle of the night on the opposite side of the road with potholes everywhere. And every now and then, a car will come and flash the high beams, and then you've got to climb up to the nature strip, which is the nature strips along those roads are basically you know like half a metre grass prickles. You can't run on them. But then you've got to climb up up the bank, let the car come past, climb back down, start running again, watch all the potholes, and there's there's like a five kilometer hill that you've got to go up. And when you get to Dover at the end, there's a one mile climb which you can bear up. It's a real brutal course. So it's not like running beach road. It's it's just um, yeah. yeah, you're running through prickles and you're running off side of road and you've got people walking in front of you, you've got to stop for lights, you've got to try not to get lost through the towns. Yeah. You come down in the the um the guy who runs the event, great man, uh, Edgar Edgie, he he'll say, okay, look, if I lose you, turn left of the McDonald's, right at the lights, <laughs> left at the hospital, right there, and, and you know I'm just like, oh, she's I'm I'm struggling to lift my legs. Yeah, and, uh, I can't think straight. Extra motions like that, and people walking in front of you and stopping for cars. It's okay. it's a real hard hard run. So how do you how do you because you mentioned when you're preparing for this event or when you started. You, you went out and ran 50Ks and your legs were shot. And yeah. like 50Ks to the average person, like probably will never run that. And some people may, 50Ks will be the most they run ever. And that was your like starting point. So, mm. which is, which is it's just crazy. But when you're running those like ultra distances or doing these ultra events that are, you know, you're, you're kind of, it's like a repetitive distance, you know, or the, the time to complete it is so long. Like in your mind, what do you, what do you, what are you talk like? How are you talking in your mind? How are you pushing yourself through either the boredom or the pain or the exhaustion? Oh, it's a real it's a real uh, roller coaster, Jakey. Um, you know, sometimes I was running on beach road, and because I do a lot of uh, I'm a swim coach, so I've got a lot of my triathlete friends that are riding their bikes. So not at three thirty in the morning, but kind of like six to onwards, you start getting people coming by and. And I had a Facebook page, you know, promoting, the, you know, what training I was doing. So I know when I'm going for a run, and it'd be give me cheers. So that was that was fantastic when I was coming on the backwards part of Frankston, people giving you a cheer. And, um, 
and that. But yeah, I basically had my AMFM radio going. I'm a simple man. I'm just still using the AMFM radio. And, um, can, can you so can I, you show the can you show the listeners your phone that you use now just to put oh, some, in yeah, context so, of so, the simple man? <laughs> that is pigeon carrier. So, <laughs> so I, was, I you know I'm a simple man. I just like doing my sport and keeping life simple and. And yeah, but as runs, yeah, it's a roller coaster. Sometimes you feel good for a lot of it. Sometimes, you know, you, you feel terrible and you just got to, I would just think, okay, keep my stride really low, relax your shoulders, work, whatever's happening. Might stop and have a quick stretch and, and then you might come good half an hour later. Sometimes yeah. you don't. You just, oh, you just hope. Is that, a, is that a thing with, with like um, some of these endurance events? Do you feel if you push through the hardship of certain mm. points, it could be the first 10K, it could be the 50K, the 100K, do you find that you do get a second wind and you actually like start to feel a bit better? Oh, is yeah. It, yeah. You, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, the, 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 when I did the, actually did the Arch to Arc, the event, I mean, it was very traumatic. Um, what happened is basically, like I said, it's the same as English Channel, you get a, a week's window. And... Um, because we only booked it a year out, we had to book a really big tide, a big spring tide, which means the water's moving further. Um, and that window we had, it was we were in the back of a hurricane from America. Yeah. So there were gale force winds. So everybody that was booked just to swim the channel, not to do the arch to arc, cancelled. Nobody even attempted to go out. Even the relay teams, which are six people, which do one hour each, didn't go out. So oh, I got the all clear because I've done a double crossing uh, with the English Channel with, this, with that with the same boatman, so he gave me special permission to swim the channel, but I had to run 140k first to get there. And then I had to swim on a day where every solo swimmer, every relay team had cancelled, so it was a lot of drama, and I got lost going through London, so I ended up running an extra 4.9k. That's so I've right. never run. It got lost going through London, uh, so I ended up running almost 145k. Swam on a day, you know, where I was on a on a massive spring tide, um, wind against tide. So I end up swimming fifty four k. So you think you're swimming a straight line, but because of the current, you're do, actually doing an S. Well, that's the thing. The, that's yeah, because that's what I was going to say. Because the swim's thirty three k's, isn't it? The English Channel or something of that nature. So all yeah. the records are done small tides and in good weather where you swim a straighter line, so the tide's not pushing you off course as much. So the weather can really impact the outcome. Yeah. Oh, um, the, the tip of France, uh, Point Grenade, you try and, the boatman tries to land you on that. If the tide's really strong and, and you're not swimming quick enough and you miss that tip, you've got to swim a lot further. So I end up missing that tip and I end up swimming um, 54k. And I could see this lighthouse because I finished you know, in the dark and um, I just started sprinting towards this lighthouse and I made a mistake because I had my earplugs in and everyone on the boat screaming, no, keep going straight. And I didn't listen so... I ended up, um, the last 400 metres took me half an hour. I was swimming, I was sprinting for my life to get to these rocks. Yeah. yeah. And the boat, he parked the boat right next to me. He goes, you've got 500 yards. <laughs> and, um, and I was sprinting. And even 20 metres out, I wasn't shocked to get in because I was so tired. I've run 145k, you know, just before that. And, um, yeah, so when I finished the swim, I was, I was a mess because I, I had to expend so much energy to get into, into the rocks because it was such a big tide. There's this. Footage that I just wanted to speak about this because I, I, I wanted to speak about this event in a bit more de in some detail just for the listeners to understand, like the arc to arc, and you, you've kind of summed it up pretty well. But in between the run, swim, and bike, there is a period of rest, as in like you yeah. might stop up at a accommodation, put the feet up for have a sleep, and then you get going. But you, <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Like you, and I think your sister, uh, Tammy, mentions it that there's not many people. That could run, you know, uh, 140 k's in under 16 hours, and then eight hours later, front up for another 12 hours, 12 hours of punishment, which is the English Channel swim. Mm -hmm. and, and there's actually, I would recommend anyone listening into this podcast that wants to see, you know, some imagery to the words Johnny's talking about. It's called Crossing the Line on YouTube, um, which was a documentary that the great man Brooksy um, developed in uh, 2014 for the Enduro Man event that you did. And it actually details um, what you're just about to talk about, which is after you finish the swim, your body mm. was at the point of exhaustion. Um, mm. I think a couple of your team members literally had to carry you in the car. Um, and you could, your, your arms are just floppy. Your legs aren't even really functioning. And your eyes mm. are at the back of your head. It's almost like you've passed out. 
Um, it looked a lot worse than, than I felt. It, um, it's it's <laughs> just like extraordinary. Um, then you went to you went and had a sleep, and it, it probably if you, if you look at that footage, you think he he can't move, like he can't go again. This is ridiculous. Mm. Um, and you guys, you get taken to accommodation, you get in a massage, you're having some food, you have a sleep, and all your team yeah. members go to bed. And uh, I think uh, forget his name, the the guy who ran ran the Enduro Man event. What was his name? Yeah. Edgar. So yeah, so he said that they've got a twelve hour window of rest. So within the twelve hours, he's got to go again if he wants to beat the world record. Mm. And everyone in your team's gone to bed. You've gone to bed. Six hours later, the first person that wakes up is John Van Wyss. And he's going, all right, let's go. And everyone else is going, what? Like, they're not ready. We, Johnny wants to go now. What? You don't want to rest. And, and you're up again. And then you bike 290 Ks. Mm. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> come on, Johnny. That is not, that's not normal. <laughs> oh, no. It's not, not a normal day. or six, 60, It's not a normal 61 hours of your, of your life. But yeah, basically, basically uh, as you were saying that, um, I'll, I'll go from the beginning. So you backlog how long you'll think the run will take and how much rest you need with the channel you leave at the high tide. So I backlog 24 hours from the high tide, which means whatever I came in under 24 hours was my rest period, but the clock doesn't stop. Right. So, so I came in 1552. Um, so my rest period was from then to there. And then with after you swim the channel, you have to start the bike within 12 hours but the clock doesn't stop. So right. if I took 12 hours, that's 12 hours onto my total time. So. Understood. So I, I, I finished the swim and I was stuffed. It's kind of like when you're trying to sleep on, uh, I'm not sure what you're like on an airplane, but I can't sleep properly on an airplane. It's kind of broken sleep. No, neither. So I was, yeah. It was a contradiction. I was that um, exhausted that I couldn't sleep properly. I was like, you know, getting cramps and pain. My throat was all swollen from the salt water. I was just in a lot of pain. Um, I couldn't sleep, and because I was well ahead of the previous record, and I'd come out of the water and I looked terrible. The crew said, "Well, let's give him the full t- legal twelve hours because he's, he- he's, he's going to get the record if he can finish the bike because he's got a good buffer." But like I said, I couldn't sleep properly anyway. So um, my crew, Big Johnny Locko, got me the, the best chicken soup I've ever had. That went down beautifully because I had the, the swollen the throat. throat. Yeah, I was getting broken sleep, and I thought. I'm not going to feel any better, you know, four hours later. Yeah. Might as well, once in a lifetime, hopefully, I won't still want to do it again. But, um, I've just got to get going, you know. The clock's not stopping. I'm functional. Let's go. So I had to get everybody up, and then we had to drive to the start. So you keep, you're keep losing time. So that's all part of it. Um, the clock doesn't stop, so you've got to work out, yeah, how long you'll think the run will take. And if you stuff that calculation up, you've stuffed everything up. So right. the more aggressive you run to the swim, the riskier it is. Okay. You've got to bear in mind, it's not it's not 140K, you know, on a flat run. It's a brutal run. Yeah, because you mentioned that with the run, the run's not an easy run. The swim, mm. depending on the weather, is not an easy swim. And then the bike isn't easy either. So you, you kind of, I think you say this in the documentary, like it's a fair race because there's no advantage for a good runner, a good swimmer, a good bike ride. All three legs are super tough. Yeah, the, the ride's real hard. Like They take you to the back roads and they wouldn't actually tell us the, the schematics of the bike. So we had normal normal gearing and we still had the big headwinds from the hurricane. So there were like 10 massive climbs and I was creeping. I was, you know, tired. And I was creeping over these hills. So yeah. I, I rode a terrible time. So I, I looked at the previous times thought, geez, these guys must be very good bike rides. But now, <laughs> now I know why. It's just a real hard bike course. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I had my time again, I'd have, um, you know, hill climbing gears, hopefully not the big headwinds. and um, So, yeah, so the whole thing was hard. But, I mean, the, and this is what the documentary shows, is that as crazy as of a cycle it was, and there's a I think there's a shot of you're almost like bike riding on the spot because the wind's yeah. blowing that hard and you're like, geez, this is tougher than I anticipated. Right. You, you stop over at Macca's and have some nuggets because you need some, like, salt in your body. But you get there and the, it's nighttime in Paris and you're kind of riding through the lights of the road because it's like a stop and start. So you get to kind of take in the, the beauty of what Paris is. But you get the world record and all your team members are there with a little sort of banner for you to ride through, popping champagne, everyone's screaming. All of pa- all the people in Paris around the Marble Arches are like running over like, who the hell is this guy? And then uh, I think Edgar just literally yells out like, this bloke has literally just ran, uh, ran, swam and biked from London to Paris and he is the world record holder. 
like that must have been one of the most amazing moments because you go back to when you were 19 mm. and you were you know as thin as anything trying to swim the english channel and go against your sister who for those that don't know was a pretty unreal swimmer and athlete and i think you say in the documentary that you guys used to have to be split up in the swim squads because you used to just fight yeah. in the water because trying to beat each other so you go from that like hardship of you not being able to complete the english channel dawn phrases there you're 19 you're like fuck this like i'm i've stuffed up i've embarrassed myself and then you've got the world record for doing like one of the biggest ultra triathlons the world has yeah like, what, what was the feeling like for you then Oh, I mean, because cause I, I, I kind of knew probably a few hours to go that I was going to make it um, and I was going to get the record. So I had a lot of time to, to chill out. and That was a great, great experience. And, um, you get stuck at all the lights going through Paris too. That's all part of it. So Yeah, yeah. Lead car stops, you have to stop. So Edgar was my guide. He basically said, so we're following him. And then I had another car with my crew. Yeah. And uh, I was having chats to Edgar. And Edgar's a, uh, a fantastic man. He was the first man to actually do the event, and then he started the company Enduro Man, which is which you you book the window for, and, and he he organises the Arch Dark. So I always like to have him as, as my guide. So oh, it was real good bonding experience with Edgar. And Edgar really wanted me to get the record. He was so you know so helpful, and they gave me fantastic advice. Um, so it was it was kind of good because I had time to chill out, and once I knew my body, I was. I was going to finish, you know, a couple of hours to go. Could just uh, reflect could kind of, and take it in. Yeah, yeah, look around and just try not to crash, do anything. Yeah, you know, <laughs> hope you don't get like that. Um, um, and also, a sense of relief, really, um, when you finish it. It really is because you know, a lot can go wrong. It's such a such a uh, hard event. Uh, so it was a massive sense of relief too when I finished. There's, um, I do want to talk about some of the inspirations and. Um, maybe just take it back to before the event because uh, you do talk about um, uh, your late great father and the, I guess, the work he did to provide for you and Tammy to be able to actually go in these events and compete. Um, yeah. Can you give us some background on who he was to you? Because I know he's, in the documentary anyway, which I've watched, which um, I recommend, as I said earlier, that everyone do watch if, if you want to know more about John Van Wyss, but you talk about how inspiring and how critical he was into who you've become. Well, I mean, my, my father was just a real hard man, so... He didn't give you much. Uh, you had to earn everything. You know, if, if somebody beat me, you'd be like, oh, I to, why am I paying a swim fee? So-and-so beat you. So he was always putting up. And he was, like I said, he was working, you know, behind the machine all day. That's all. I couldn't do that. I'm not mentally tough enough to do that. Yeah. So um, I was, you know, living the life, doing doing what I love, you know, trying to, trying to get better at whatever sport I was doing at the time. And it was a great life, even though, like, so you're living off breadcrumbs and things. You know, I'll be working as well part time, trying to train as hard as I could. Basically, everything, your whole mentality revolves around how can I get better and faster and stronger. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so Dad used to fund fund a lot of our a lot of our events, and he was get, he was obviously getting a kick out of that, but he wouldn't show it. But so yeah, I was always trying to impress him, and you know, so I won this or I won that, or if I lost, I'd be you know I'd go hiding and <laughs> <how many problems? laughs> yeah, steer clear of his eye line. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah, um, he was he was family man. That's that's so, and and one thing you do mention as well is like when when the some of the events get tough, you kind of think of him behind the machine, don't you? Because it's like a, yeah, well, it keeps you well, going. Well, so I, I, when I left school, um, I, I did a, actually the printing course as well. Then I went overseas and raced. There's no way I could stand behind the machine all day. That was it was. I'm not tough enough to do that. So yeah. Um, I would go down the back sometimes and help him out, but I couldn't last an hour. I was like, oh, let's get out of here. Um, so, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah, I don't, real, think like, I'd last, I don't think I'd last an hour. <laughs> I might not be making much money, but I'm doing what I love. You know, yeah. I'm easy. I'm massively. Um, so I was very, very privileged, very lucky. So, so yeah. For, for you, what what do you think, and this is probably a question for everyone who, who's been listening in and, and knows a bit about you and your story and the you know, just the lengths that you're willing to take yourself. But what do you think the benefits are of pushing your body through that hardship? Oh, don't have any benefits. <laughs> <laughs> Physically. <laughs> but like, no. but me, me, probably mentally though, right? There's got to be some yeah. sort of liberation or some sort of mental toughness that really sets you up in other areas of your life. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. 
So I was never going to cure cancer. I'm not smart enough. So sport was my go. And I, I was just doing what I loved. And one thing led to the next. Like you, you start with, um, you know, with a, a small swim and maybe, a, maybe, when I say small, maybe a 10K swim. And then you think, oh, I can make 10K. Maybe I'll try 20. And then once you get on top of anything, oh, I'll try, you know, an English channel. Like I, I didn't like, like I said earlier, I didn't finish my first English channel. And 20 years later, I did a double crossing in the English channel. So, had you told me, you know, when I just when I just woken up in the, in the arms of Dawn Fraser that 20 years later you'd be doing a double crossing, you know, I'd be going, oh, geez, it's a long way off that. Yeah, no shit. But one thing leads to the next. You learn from your mistakes, and you, you, what that saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger if you keep keep uh, working at it. And it's just been if you get. You get a, a base of strength in one thing, and then then I'd change sports, um, and then I'd go back to swimming, and I'd still got that big base there. So once I started getting on a roll, I, I felt good again, and then you know learning learning how to run long, long, long distances, you know, with, with my barefoot stuff and my shuffling, and I found that real, real. Uh, I got a kick out of doing seventy k, you know, training runs. Not not when the alarm went off at three in the morning, but when I'd finished the run, I think, geez, I've run. You know, I run the Frankston and back. Then I have to there, work in the afternoon coaching. There's a story, it. actually. I just want to talk about one of your 70K runs. There's a story that the day you decided you were going to do the Arc to Arc, which was actually New Year's Day, and I just want you to validate if this is true or not because this is just a story I've heard, but apparently it was New Year's Day you decided, oh, I'm going to do the Arc to Arc, and that day, then and there, you ran 70Ks, New Year's Day. Oh, I, had, that, I had built that. That's probably did a bit of power on that. <laughs> oh, that that doesn't mate. That's a Johnny Locko bit of mayo then, because I'm pretty oh, sure it came from his mouth. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go. No, I did. I did some 50k's first, and like I said, my first 50 was a shocker. Right. I, um, I got the sledgehammered legs, and I thought, geez, I can't run 50 k. I got to run under 40. Yeah. Uh, and then, like I said, I was on Beach Road, so all my mates could see me, you know, walking. And it's kind of embarrassing. So then I experimented with. with um, I spent a fortune on different runners. You know, all the long distance runners and I trialed that out and not, that didn't help and, that, and so I did a bit of research on the internet and found Giannis Kouros and tried to run like he did like a duck with my knees out and my toes pointing out and that it looked kind work. of silly didn't work for me yeah and then I found that Dean Canasa so I tried the bare foot and, and then then I worked out myself that well geez when my legs get tired I bring I bring the legs through really low on the follow through and keep my arms a bit lower and that's a bit more efficient that the old Cliff Young shuffle so yeah, so it was a bit of a learning learning experience, and I got got a real kick out of kind of learning that as I went, and as I got, you know, like I said, when when you run seventy k, and then I'd, then I'd you know have breakfast with my mates, and I'd have to work that afternoon, you know, so I'd be on my feet for another three four hours. So you kind of think, oh, geez, I'm doing all right, you know, middle aged man, I'm running seventy k. Bloody oh, you know, I, I got a kick out of doing that stuff. Not, but I said when the alarm went off at three in the morning, I wasn't keen to get out of bed. It was. The thoughts, the thought, just like any person, the thoughts are, geez, I could easily forget the alarm went off and go back to sleep. It's funny um, though, when, when that happens, right, it's funny how the human brain does that to you and it really challenges you and then you get five, five to 10K into your run and you're like, you're feeling on top of the world and it's like, how, who was uh, that person in bed? It's a complete For me, it was person. like, I turned to come back, so I was probably 35. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thirty. Yeah, but for my five k is your fifty, and this okay. is what I wanted to, wanted to wanted to what? ask you for for because I'm actually trying to uh, take my running just to like a longer distance, more purely because I'm not really training for anything, but more just the mental side of like I've always had this ceiling on how far I can run, like a ten k, or that's a maximum. And then I actually did twenty one k the other month, that's and it was like uh, you know I was my plan was to do like fifteen, sixteen k, and I'm like, well. If I keep going here, I'm 5k off like half a marathon. That's a big milestone yeah. for me. But oh, that's fair. For, for the for the average person, right? Like like myself, who running distances have these like mental barriers without realizing on their distance of running. Like, is there any like if you were if you were our coach, for example, what advice would you be giving us to break that shackle of like you know the barrier that we've set ourselves? Oh, I mean, I think the key is trying to switch your brain off for this kind of stuff. The more you think. The more you psych yourself out. So, yeah. and when you do have a hard period, that's when you got to try and chill out. I, like I had the music going and try and think happy thoughts. But like I said, I, I've had some bad, bad experiences um, during endurance events where you know, we're you now like an English Channel and things like that, where things haven't gone well. 
you know, you get injured, injuries and things. So it doesn't always pan out, but I, I think for endurance sports, you, you, like, you know, that famous saying, you're in your zone, whatever that means, but just switching your brain off and trying to get in the rhythm and listen to your body and smell the fresh air and just try and get a rhythm and just keep going. And often, you know, five, ten minutes later, you come good again. Yeah. So it's like controlling that internal noise a little bit and just si- you simplify the whole process by just like almost like trying to be present, like get in this flow state of this is where exactly. you're just staying exactly in the moment. I think it's kind of like, you know, if you're really hungry and you put food in the microwave for two minutes and you're waiting there, it feels like half an hour. <laughs> really brain off, what's two minutes? Yeah. So it's all relative to your, your mindset at the time. So like I said, I've had moments where I've stuffed a lot of times I've stuffed up and I haven't done that. But when things are going well, it's generally you, you're chilling out in your head and you're just in the zone um, and just, yeah, off you go. So is that like is that your technique, I guess, to remaining calm and positive in some of these long-distance events or ultra triathlons when you're not feeling great or shit's hitting the fan? Like, for instance, the swim you did in the English Channel, like, mm. I defy anyone, the average person, be able to swim a kilometre in that because... I think you say it in the in the uh, documentary, but you're swimming freestyle, and you, the way you swim, like you just, cr- it looks like you just crunch the water, like you're just eating water, just smashing through. But it, the tide was so rough that day that literally your, your left arm was in the water, and your right leg was in the air, and your body's at right angles and left angles, and like, is that your like? How do you control how your brain's functioning in a moment of panic? That like you know what you can't control is being thrown at you. Yeah, I mean, look, look I said, I, I had a real baby moment during that too. I was, uh, the start, we had, like I said, we had wind against tide, so it was really awkward chop. So it's some bigger waves, but it was just awkward because the water was all over the place. So yeah. I couldn't get a body position. So you feel like somebody's grabbing you and ragdolling you. So I could, my brain was getting, the small brain I've got was getting, you know, ragdolled around. I couldn't, couldn't get a rhythm. And two hours in, I said to the boatman who's, who I, I told you I've got a good history with, I've done a, you know, I did a single crossing with him, a double crossing with him. He was there when I got pulled out of the water um, for my first fail attempt. He, I was hoping to get a bit of love from him. He goes, I go, is this going to get any better? He goes, I thought you were a swimmer. Swim. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought, fair enough. I've been a bit of a baby. So um, I got going That's again. Oh, okay, it came good. And then the wind died down in the second half, so it wasn't wasn't as bad, but the first kind of four or five hours was real um, kind of um, half metre, one metre of waves, but real awkward waves, just all over the shop. Like, so I couldn't, I couldn't get my body in a, in a stable position where often when it's rough, you can smash through the waves, but then you get a nice bit for, you know, for two or three seconds. This was constantly, and my body was on all different angles. And I was against, I was against a massive, uh, massive tide. So when you see my GPS later, it's a huge S. So I end up yeah. swimming there, okay, and that's purely because the, um, you know, we we're on a big spring tide, and, and I was just unlucky to have the, the, the big headwinds against the tide. Yeah, there's also a, a moment in that where, um, I think it's not that you're you're struggling with your swim. The tide's pretty tough, but um, I think they talk about Tammy messaged someone on the boat to say, give him like some hot water, <laughs> and and you they you pull over near the boat and they give you like a. Of some ribena or they give you a, like a hot bottle and you you put that in your body because I, like the, the water that long in any form of cold water you must be close to battling like hypothermia or some sort of you know ridiculous as you as you experienced when you were 19 but this yeah. like is your body like are you close to experience hypothermia one and then secondary when you were drinking that hot water it seemed to improve your swim um, yeah i mean yeah, the, the arch is the arch is different. If you're just doing English Channel swim, you can't wear a wetsuit, so you've got to get fat. Um, right. For this swim, for it's a triathlon, you can wear a wetsuit. So I didn't have to get as fat as I would if I was just doing a channel. Um, so the wetsuit's a huge, huge advantage. But because I because I was obviously um, exhausted from doing the run, and you've only had limited rest, uh, and you're swimming against um, you know awkward chop, it takes it out of you. So the energy that you have uh, to, to move forwards and to fight the cold is, is is reduced. And so I wasn't cold initially, but probably halfway into it, the cold started creeping in, which on paper you wouldn't think it would because you got a suit on. Even though I was skinnier than when I um, did my double crossing, I still had a suit on. So 
but yeah, because you, you're, you're lower in energy from the run um, and, and it was terrible conditions, that, that energy you normally use to keep warm as well. So it's it kind of starts creeping in. Yeah. And, uh, once you get cold, you never get warm again. It gets worse. That's it's like Chinese torture. <laughs> uh, what, what gets you warm is how fat you are and how how much intensity you're swimming at because you're generating heat. So warm, warm the body. Get yeah. Hot, yeah. Low, and you're not generating as much heat. It's a bit like if, if you get up in the morning and it's two degrees, you'll get warm if you start running. But if you're walking, you need more clothes. Yeah. So same thing with swimming. So so every athlete has to work out how fat they want to get to, to take take on the channel, bearing in mind that this you get the advantage of a wetsuit. But if you're doing um, a solo swim, just uh, saying, the yeah. slower the slower you swim, the fatter you're gonna you, you're gonna have to get because you're gonna be in the water longer. Right. Um, yes. Yeah, so so I did start getting cold and tired, and then like I said, um, I missed the point of Cape Grenade, the closest tip of France, because the tide was so big. And then I, I was swimming on this. I was barely moving in the last four hundred meters against the tide. I was sprinting, um, and that really knocked me about because any bit of energy I had left, I was I basically the hardest half an hour I could do just to get yeah. in to, to get to the rocks, and that that really sucked all my energy out. And, yeah. and that's why when I when I um, got back in the boat and they and they come, the second crew come pick me up, I, I looked like I was dying. Yeah, I, I don't know how. I wasn't. I wasn't as bad as I looked. I was just very low on energy. I, I just wanted. I just had enough. I was just trying to use enough energy to, you know, to, to get back to the hotel and have a nap. Yeah. So when um, there's actually there's a few questions uh, questions I put out a a thing yesterday on Instagram on the Unlaced Podcast Instagram, just for some of the listeners. I said we're getting an ultra triathlete on today. What are, what are some of the things you want to ask? And we did get a few questions in. Um, one of them's kind of funny, but I don't know if you know this person. But one of them was, "Have you heard of David Goggins? Do you know who that is?" Oh, that's the um, yeah, I've seen him on the YouTube. He does yeah. all ultras. Yeah, correct. Well, like, and I think the reason why they've asked me this, and this is actually um, one of the things I'm going to say about this episode. But I like you are you are David Goggins before David Goggins. Like the the whole mentality of what he does. The only thing that maybe he does different is he puts it on YouTube and just screams at the camera and calls everyone. You know, weak, weak as anything. Oh, <laughs> Where, whereas you do it a bit more silently. Believe it but or not, you, se- you seem like a pretty firm character, like him. Where like nothing is going to stop you, and you're you're owning your mind, which is owning your physical activity, which is pretty. Oh no, nah, I wouldn't go that way. far. I've oh, had a lot of, I've had a lot of DNFs and you know, injuries, and it's a roller coaster. Yeah, you remember. See the see the good results, but there's a lot of times where I've had stuff ups. And, um, it's yeah, if you're doing something big, you can have a lot of failures, and then you, you learn from your experiences, and you try and you know um, get rid of what's what stopped you, and and yeah, you try and get bigger and better and stronger, and but it's been a real roller coaster, and um, yeah. So that's the beauty of the endurance sports. It's it's kind of a, like a metaphor of life. You never know what's around the corner. Yeah, it can be yeah. good. And then all of a sudden you get a punch in the head. You say, "Where'd that come from?" You know, <laughs> it's, just, it's put into you know in the archers' case, sixty-one hours of, of a roller coaster of emotions. Um, when life, you can have you know five good years, and all of a sudden something happens, and you go, "Oh, geez, how did that happen? I lost my job or something like that." So yeah. I always look at the endurance sports. It's it's a real roller coaster, but in a in a compacted um, event. Yeah, that's pretty inspiring to hear here, Johnny. Um, just want to go through a couple of these questions, but um, some some of them are quite funny. But one was, do you get bored when you train? I do. Yeah, it's it's funny because you know, like uh, like I was telling you, some of my training sessions, like I was training as much as I could. I was doing basically four things a day. I was doing weights, the barefoot running, uh, swimming, cycling, and you know, you just it just it's just all consuming. And then I'd be working morning and night, so they were massive days. So I'd, I'd be exhausted, and the Saturday I'd just do my, my seventy k, um, seventy k run. So, you know, a lot of the times you're just trying to get through the day. I'd, I'd start start off say with my barefoot run, or I'd start off with a gym, and then um, go straight to Denny Park, then my barefoot run. And it's, it's human nature to be running, thinking, "Geez, now I've got to go." And after this, I've got to go swim six k, you know, at the pool. Yeah. You know, so sometimes it's a mental test just to to get through a normal day and. Just keep accumulating the, the training. 
Can, can uh, you take us through like one of what, what a normal day is for you, like right now or maybe when you're training, just for context of how intense it can be? Oh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm all or nothing. So at the moment, I'm swimming. I'm hardly I'm swimming twice a day in a day, yeah. and I'm just doing um, a few weights in the middle of the day and push ups so and the, things. This is that's nothing. Just to clarify. Yeah, that's. I mean, I was swimming in a day. <laughs> so three sessions a day is just. Ah, just oh quiet. yeah, that's enjoyable. You know, that's like no. Right. I'm probably doing five k, five days a week, in the, and uh, um, okay. yeah. But for the arch, you know, once I once I got going, I was doing yeah four things a day. Uh, except the Sunday was my long swim day, so I generally do um, a 12k pool set. I do 120 hundreds in the pool, um, and then I'd go to the gym after and jump on the bike and do a few weights. Um, the Saturday was my big run day, so it'd be a 70k uh, run, but I wouldn't do anything else. So I'd just have to work in the afternoon. Yeah. But then Monday to Friday, I would I would do you know my barefoot run. I would do my weights. I would do my bike, I'd do my swim, which was generally a 6K swim. So it, it became a challenge just to, to turn up, and every day was epic. So I'd be yeah. real tired. Get, you'd, be, you'd get over it. Like you would, you wouldn't want to talk about it. I'd get home, I wouldn't want to talk about my training. I just want to switch my brain off and yeah. watch telly. And else. Um, so it, it, gets, it gets too much. So, and it's funny because when I don't have a goal, I would go to the pool. I would struggle to swim two k. <laughs> yeah. Um, after the arts, because I, I I got a group of mates, I'd go to the pool with and you know have a coffee swim. And when I got back from the arch, uh, it was quite a few months later because I was pretty exhausted, and I'd, I'd have my casual swim with the mates and yeah, and it's okay. Let's do two k. And I ended up getting out after one k because I was bored. Yeah. So yeah, you know, person that three months early was doing six k's. Plus the running and cycling and weights, and then you know, twelve k swim on a Sunday struggles to do two k. <laughs> so, uh, um, but it's it's interesting for me because I can relate to what you say there. Because there's been periods where I train super hard, I feel, and there's mm. periods where I'm just completely pole opposite, and I feel like I'm lazy. And I'm like, how's there two different people? But the one thing that I've realised when I analyse that is that when I'm going hard at something, it's because I've attached it to a goal or an outcome that I'm going for. And when I don't have something to go for, it's like, well, what's the point? Do you think mm. that's pretty important with endurance training or just training in general? If there's not something to carry it at the end, is it is it harder for you to get the most out of yourself, like you said? Oh, for me, it is, especially at, at my age, because you know, when I was young, and, you know, you're, you're a different person when you're young, you're, you're trying to take on the world you haven't achieved yet. so. You're full of beans. As I, as I've got older, I, I need a goal now. I need something to get me excited. Um, if I don't, I, I struggle. You know, yeah. so in my weight, my weight, um, like I've just lost some weight again. But I, I put on eight kilos during the first coronavirus lockdown. <laughs> you know? it's I I, yeah, <laughs> I actually did. I actually did a uh, a swim race um, in Williamstown in winter. And I saw the photos of me running out of the water, but geez, I've got to, I've got to start losing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boy, that middle-aged man running out the beach. That's actually so, one yeah. of the one of the questions from the listeners, and this is a bit bit about nutrition, but in particular, um, and this is from uh, Matt Christodoulou, my my mate. Shout out, Maddie. But what's your who's taken up? You know, he's running quite seriously. But he he asks here, what's your race day nutrition? Like how oh. do you, because it's all race days because some of your events go over three days. Yeah, for, for the actual um, uh, Arch to Arc, I used, I've actually got these bars here, I'll show you. Yeah, please do. The great man, John Van Wees. He, I've seen you eating oats, healthy oats, and ending up in Macca's, eating a Macca's meal. But... Oh, these are called uh, access bars. Access and, bars, um, okay. Yeah, so you have to have them on an empty stomach, and it's the oh. amount in the loading of each ingredient which helps turn your fat. Yeah, it helps you utilize your body fat. So you actually, the theory is you, you burn your body fat, but you can't right. have any, you have to have it with water. You can't have any calories, but you have to have it on empty stomach. So we first found that they were called Cold Buster Bars back in um, the early 90s. And there was a show on Channel 10 called, um, uh, what was it called? Something to the Future. It was about, we, we saw um, these Canadian uh, armed forces were on these Cold Buster Bars right. and they were in, in a, um, a freezer on a bike 
eating these coal buster bars. So they'll, they'll put in the Canadian Armed Forces as, as a survival bar to help you shiver longer. So we thought that'd be really good for the English Channel. So we contacted Channel 10, that TV show. Uh, oh, it's called Beyond 2000. That was, right. this is okay. in, and uh, we became friends with uh, Dr. Yang, who invented the bars, and he gave us, he sponsored us, he gave us bars. And, and then it turned out that if you keep eating and you lose weight, because it helps you use your body fat. And I stopped using them after the channel, um, but, but my sister kept using them and they sponsored her. And then since then, they've, re, they've relabeled them the access bar, and, um, and they use it for all sports now because it helps you use your body fat. So when I did the arch, I did the first probably 70, 80 K on water and just the access bars. But then after that, I went on to, on to natural food like sandwiches. Um, uh, I had a pizza at the end, <laughs> right at the end. <laughs> the funny story, because I was craving a pizza and Johnny Locko, who's the main man of my crew, he went ahead into Dover and the pizza shop was just closing and, and he said, oh, look, I've got this crazy guy, you know, running from, you know, running from London, can, can you get a pizza? And the guy especially reopened up for us and made us a pizza and Legend. didn't charge us. And, you know, he became friends on social media with us. And, uh, he started following the event on the social media. And so I had that pizza and that was magnificent. Then in the morning before the, the swim, I had uh, scrambled eggs. Um, and then when I did the, uh, did the bike, I was a mess and, uh, Edgar Edgy, the guy who runs the event, said, whoever gets to this McDonald's, which is about 60K into the event, always stops and has Maccas because they're exhausted. So I ended up doing that too. And I stopped at the Maccas and I had, um, you know, Sundays and Big Mac. I can't remember what I had. I, had, I was just craving junk food. Yeah, I was, you I was salt. You needed salt, didn't you? you oh, I needed salt and sugar. I needed fat. I needed any calories. I was just stuck. And, and the, the rest of the bike ride, the crew would go ahead and, and get McDonald's and bring it back to me. So I probably had maybe four times I had McDonald's during the 290k ride where the crew would get the second, because we had two cars, so the second crew would go to a McDonald's, they would work out where one is and, and come back and bring me McDonald's because I was just, you know, craving craving food. And I remember um, when I got back, I was I was eight kilos lighter than when I, was, when I left and so my body just kept eating itself, even when I finished the event. I was wow. eating. yeah, just it would become life and death. So I was just craving, craving calories. But so what? What's the magical diet? I don't know. But Edgar always says that everyone who has a you know a diet plan like a sports drink uh, or special bars, approximately you know eighty k into the run, they just say, "Can you go get me some hot chips?" <laughs> yeah, it goes out the window. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I don't know with the science. Uh, I'm, I'm mixed on that. Whatever you can stomach. Yeah, I find okay. I after a while, if I have you know sports drinks, and, um, so I I tend to have you know like uh, real, more real food. Uh, but at the start of the run, I had those uh, access bars for the first first half of the run, just on on water and um, and an uh, empty stomach, just had the bars, and and then and then after that, I got onto on got onto real food. But, um, but yeah, so. I don't have any, a real answer for that. It's just trial and error, and, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, everything yeah. doesn't doesn't work, you know. So that's pretty pretty crazy, and I can imagine there'd be the body cravings would overtake the rational thinking before the start of the race at, at some point. But um, I guess just to, just to kind of round out the the podcast and the conversation with with Johnny Van Wist, who. If you've been listening right now, you're probably ready to run through a wall or really questioning your own exercise cycle of, you know, what you're doing from a distance point of view because Johnny's just going to lengths that the average human can't and mentally doesn't even want to know about. But for you, what what's next now after you've done so much and all these achievements? Like, what, what more do you want to achieve oh, that that's not there? Oh, I still want another crack at the arch, Jake. So I was going to go last year, but I, uh, I hurt my Achilles and... Um, yeah, I, I have a trained. I was um, in really good shape. I was doing my barefoot running, and I was doing the distance of the arch in a week. So I was running approximately 140 k a week, riding 300 k a week, and um, swimming about 40 k a week. And then I was seven weeks out, and uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to step it up. So I, I did an extra 40 k in that week, most of it barefoot. Then I uh, got a slight tear in my Achilles, 
Um, and I already had the Achilles tendonitis in both Achilles, so I was already, you know, you know, struggling to get through the training. And if, but if I was coaching somebody, I wouldn't tell them, I wouldn't advise to do that because you're yeah. emotionally involved in yourself. I yeah. stupidly kept it up. And then I did um, six weeks of water running, thinking I'm still going to go. Um, and then uh, my swimming squads, there's a lovely lady, Claire, who was going to take my swim squads while I was away. She saw me still limping. She goes, just get an MRI. And this is, you know, a week before I was supposed to go. It's got the MRI, got it sent to a physio, um, and the physio said, oh, it's all good. So I thought, oh, fantastic. So I tried to run the next day. I couldn't run still. I was hobbling that night at squad. I was like, oh, God, maybe it's in my head. I'm mentally weak. Um, got sent the scan off to a friend who's a sturgeon, and he said, oh, no, it's terrible. Don't go. Then I got the actual report back from the, from the MRI people and said, yeah, you've got a little tear in your Achilles, you've got ten and eyes, got a crack in your heels. Not good. So I had to make a decision because, you know, I'd spent all this money. You know, I, I was first time ever I was going business class. Um, the accommodation was like $5,000. The entry for the event, about $10,000. So I was, I'd laid out all this money, I'd invest all this training. So it was Friday and my, I was booked to leave on Sunday. So I put uh, heel raises in the back of my shoes. Uh, I strapped up my Achilles. I got on Nurofen. I tried running around the block and I struggled to run 5K. And I thought, I've got no chance of breaking any records. Yeah. So I had to pull it in on the event. So, so yeah, so it's a, it's a real roller coaster. So I want to, I want to go back and uh, get my body right. But it's 10, it's 10 months. Oh, it's a year later now. I've still got the Achilles tendonitis. So right. I'm trying to work. I'm not running at the moment. I tried running again. Um, I was still sore, so I couldn't get a window for next year's Ash Ark because of the coronavirus and the Brexit. Mm. So I'm trying to get a window for 2022. But my goal in the next, you know, six months is to try and to um, get my uh, tendons strong in both Achilles and make them make them bulletproof and get rid of the tendonitis. And don't make the mistake I did. You know, if I can get a window again, don't overtrain. train. Be happy. If things are going well, just leave it alone. <laughs> get stupid. Yeah. Don't um, and actually, yeah, with this coronavirus, I feel like regenerated again. So I feel like I want to um, really um, have a crack again. That is a, a frightening thought to think that if you're regenerated, I'm scared to hear what's going to come next or excited, I should say. And um, I definitely want to get on, uh, hopefully those tendons sorted, because I do want to come on a run with you and see how long I last uh, with a great <laughs> man. But it would be um, inspiring to it'd be inspiring to train with you one day for sure. That'd be a goal of mine. So. Um, mate, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a, an absolute joy, Johnny. And your story, your story needs to be heard. And as I said earlier, for those that want to know more about Johnny, actually watch the Enduro Man event that he did in 2014, where he had the world record, and by no means was it an easy conditions to do so. Uh, it's on YouTube, and it's called Crossing the Line, John Van Wyss. Um And you can watch the whole documentary on there. It's, it goes for about an hour, but it's an hour well spent. So. Thanks, uh, Jake. Yeah, bad. <laughs> hey, yeah, that's right, mate. No, but thanks again, Johnny. We'll, we'll definitely have you on in due course, and I'll, I'll hopefully can share some stories of me me running and training with you in the future and share people with awesome. uh, how hard it is. <laughs> thanks, Jake. No worries, mate. Cheers.